Thank you very much, Herb. Um, let me just see. So that's the... Okay. Well, thank you very much. So my talk today, I'm principally going to focus on this thing called the carbonate balance of reefs. And the general idea here is if the carbonate balance is positive, then reefs themselves have the ability to grow. But if it's negative, they will shrink and, and move away. And basically, we want to know what that, how that will respond to future climate predictions that are currently out there. For that talk, this picture, for me, it's a lovely picture, but it's missing a key item, which lots of people have referred to. I can't see so many hard calls, and I prefer to look at this picture here, which is a, uh, a, what I think is a typical growth zone of a reef that you might find off the side of the reef here, for instance. And it clearly highlights uh, the 3D structure that you get out of these reefs. And also, the, this is sort of essential almost to the definition of a coral reef, where the platform is actually built and developed by these hard corals. Okay. By contrast, there are places that people call reefs that look like this, and this is a shot that Ovha Gulberg took in Abu, Abu Dhabi. There are still corals very much surviving here, okay, but they're not providing the necessary growth rates to build the reef structure and you can see here the artificial reef structure that they've introduced. So this is what we hope those nice growth zones won't reduce to in the future. So of course the carbonate balance, most people focus on the role of the hard coral and I have in my introduction, but it's a balance between this growth and also the various processes of erosion that go on. So you can actually have a reef growing as long as uh, the slow rate of growth of corals that might be evident on that reef is matched by a slow bioerosion bio rate. Okay, so one thing we want to do is not just look at corals, but actually look at the, uh, what's happening to the bioeroders on the reef. And there are many bioeroders on reefs. There are those that eat into uh, the internal structures of corals, endolithic communities, specifically algae and sponges of the like, and they tend to prime these uh, structures for more external, uh, external erosion by, say, um, uh, fish and or wave action and the cyclones as they come in. So that's the second aspect. A third aspect, sometimes not sort of introduced with the notion of the calcium, uh, calcium uh, carbonate balance of reefs, but very important to it, is also how the competitors are doing, those things that don't uh, calcify, okay, how well they're going to fare into the future. And those are mostly represented as algae and phase shifts to algae on reefs are very well documented, but also some reefs shift over to soft coral structures and that is equally as damaging for the carbonate balance of reefs as uh, algae. So when we ask our question and how we're approaching it in the lab is what will happen to reefs under future atmospheric PCO2, it really breaks down into these three responses and we shouldn't just focus on the top response um, with regards to this question. So to answer it, we want to know how the reefs will respond to the future. We don't have those future environments at the moment. Okay, so we have to do it experimentally. And to do it experimentally, we have to make certain compromises. Our first compromise is we don't focus on all reefs. We focus on one reef. Heron Island is where we have chosen to go. Heron Island's uh, uh, the Capricorn... Um, uh, 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 it's Capricornia latitude, it's highly variable uh, with regards to the physical parameters, temperature and PCO2 that are introduced at this reef site. Furthermore, when we've come to doing our experiments, we don't just focus on the whole reef, we've chosen to focus on the specific area. Okay? And that specific area looks pretty much like the type of reefs, the growth zones that we like. And also we focused on it because just here, the SIRO have put a buoy that gives us um, um, incremental measurements on the basis of every three hours for temperature and PCO2 as it occurs. 
And, and that allows us to take this data and feed it into our aquaria that we set up on the reef, okay, so we can make all of our experiments fluctuate according to that input data. The other thing we've done as shortcuts, because to some extent we worry about the time frame we have to find out about what's going to happen to these reefs in the future. It's well documented that uh, on our present track, do nothing, we're going to go up to very high uh, PCO2 and uh, uh, um, temperatures. And probably the next version of the IPCC is going to make these uh, figures look more mid-range and the scenario is actually going to look worse. So people have, on the whole, tended to focus either on acidification experiments with regards to calcification or sea temperature where they've looked at mortality when it's come to corals. A few have mixed the two, okay, but they've not thrown in the fluctuation effect that happens on reefs. And many have argued that reefs that fluctuate a lot are going to be basically better at coping with the future than reefs that don't because their ability to acclimate or even potentially adapt is going to be that much greater because of the variation they already experience. So if you'll notice these numbers here, we've, these are the, basically the four treatments that we have selected to expose our um, organisms taken from that Harry's Bommie site at five meters and see how, what their fate is in the long term. You'll notice that today is a zero for both the CO2 and for the temperature. Okay, obviously that's not the temperature in the water, that's the offset. Okay, and so all of our treatments are given an offset to what we're actually measuring um, out at Harry's Bommy with regards to the CO2. So I think this takes care of some of Jim's worries. Okay, also, you know, in the past we've always tended to flatline. Okay, and we flatline the temperature, and we flatline the same temperature irrespectively of whether we're doing it in summer or winter. Okay? As you can see, this is the data from that boy at Harry's Bormy, the fluctuation, as others have said, is huge between winter and summer with regards to PCO2, and it happens both on a diurnal and seasonal basis. So our experimental system basically introduces this, and now we perform our experiments on a seasonal basis. We perform a summer experiment, a winter experiment. What we hope to get is an overall response, annual response instead of just focusing on what happens in the summer. So if things grow better in the summer, maybe they do worse in winter and vice versa. The experimental system has been two, two and a half years in the design. It's taken a lot of heartbreak to get it there and a lot of changing it. Over, it's set out on the deck of Heron Island. Over on the left-hand side here, you can see these large eskies. Okay, the staff at Heron Island always want to store their beer in there in the summer, but we won't let them in. And they're basically sealed tanks where we can perfect our temperatures and PCO2s to a very fine degree. We have four tanks for four treatments four incredibly large heater chillers to control the temperature because we found that that was quite difficult. We ripped out the controllers they gave us. We put in new controllers that actually respond to a lookup table which is fed in from the reef. And then we delta offset from there. Likewise for PCO2, we have a shed. And this shed essentially works rather like a large heater chiller. It has a PCO2 free air and CO2 enriched air and we basically mix them and bubble them through these tanks so that we can get the PCO2 scenarios that we want. And likewise, we've had to rip out the original PCO2 controller we had and put in a new one so it could follow our lookup tables. On the deck, we have basically three different experimental tables. Each of them can house uh, 24 tanks. Okay, and what this gives us an ability to do is we can have tank replicates for our four treatments, but then we can throw in another factor so we can enrich with nutrients or we can feed or we can do a, a change the light conditions to see what's happening. 
On the sides here, we've got these larger tubs, and that's basically for our mesocosm experiments, okay, where we want to go for more holistic response. So instead of just studying the individual response, um, these are much long, long term. And you'll notice each of these tanks have a blue clear filter over the top of us, and that gives us the light environment for Harry's Bommy. So basically, we're trying, going to try and piece together what's going to happen to Harry's Bommy under the different um, PCO2 environments, um, um, allowing for seasonal and diurnal fluctuations. So this is just some of our data. This is the control for temperature just for the month of September the daily averages, and you can see how well we actually get to mirror that. It's very clean. The PCO2, we've got our oscillations going on. We do quite well here. We lose a little bit of the trend above, but we, the amplitudes of the oscillation is, is pretty close, so we're really quite happy with that. So on to the studies we've been doing um, in this system. We started with corals. We started with uh, staghorn coral. We tried to take care to allow our corals to heal before we start exposing them to any type of treatment. In the past, it's been tempted to cut them off. You throw them in, you have open skeleton exposed to the water instead of having the tissue sealed off. And so here you can see apical po uh, polyps forming at both ends. That's the start place. We then slowly over three weeks for this experiment introduce them to the new experimental system and then we follow to see what's going to happen. In this case, Myrta did the experiment late spring to early summer and we got some fairly surprising results, we think. Okay. So for instance, we followed mortality. Okay. And as you can see, we got a really steep climb after seven weeks in the treatment for this coral. Why are we surprised? because the temperature actually hike for that season was very low. So if we talk in the NOAA um, uh, terms, it was only 1.4 degree heating weeks, which most people don't even uh, uh, um, align with much bleaching, let alone with huge mortality hikes. So we argue that this is one of the justifications, perhaps, for bringing in the synergistic effects of temperature and acidity at the same time. You don't necessarily get the responses um, that you expect. Calcification. Okay. In this experiment, we had an unfed and we had a fed set of corals. And we got some surprising results. Okay. It's all bad if you go up to the future. The calcification rates here were significantly impacted. If we didn't feed them, we went to the pre-industrial, so dialing back the clock about 100 years to the control, same rates, and then we have a, had a step-down effect where we saw it drop to about a third. That step-down is huge, and for us, we compare these results to a previous study we did in um, late summer, okay, um, by Ken Anthony, the actual decreases in calcification were much lower. But more interestingly, when we fed the corals, we got a very funny response in the, coral, in the controls. We saw between the pre-industrial and uh, the controls a big step down. And what was even more interesting is that that step down in calcification okay, was matched by an increase in protein for that treatment. So there appeared to be a very interesting trade-off going on in this respect. We didn't see any hikes in lipids, okay? And then, strangely enough, raw photosynthetic data stayed pretty much the same through all of the data. So, of course, this increase in protein isn't going to help our carbonate balance very much for those treatments. So, to the other side of the coin, the bioerosion, okay? Bioerosion is done principally by endolithic communities, which are composed of fungi, algae, um, and bacteria. Okay? Um, mostly, those, uh, the, the erosion rates are more associated when the coral is dead. So for this experiment, uh, Catalina, who's my student, uh, basically removed all the tissue that went around and then followed what happened. 
So what I'm showing uh, over here is the dissolution rates that you, you saw if you allowed normal diurnal cycles to occur um, with light and dark. And you can see a quite insignificant increase in the bioerosion rates over time. Interestingly enough, in the dark, she had a few that she put aside to see what happens. The variability was quite huge, but we almost got a little bit of an incremental climb. But this is the net result of light and dark, and it doesn't look very good. So if we looked at our data to date that we've collected, we've got calcification rates decreasing, and we've got the bioerosion rates increasing, which is not a good look for the carbonate balance as yet. The other side of the coin was to look at what the algae were doing. Okay, so we especially, lots of people have been working on uh, CCAs, algae that deposit calcium carbonate. We wanted to look at what was going to happen to ones that didn't have calcium carbonate and just look at biomass changes with regards to them. Um, Doro uh, Bender, Dorothea Bender, my student, did this work. Um, she wanted to throw in a nutrient um, aspect to this uh, treatment. So we had a high nutrient treatment. The mean was probably more like three micromolar ammonia. It's pretty low nutrient additions. Okay? But what we saw is, counter what some people have proposed with red algae, they didn't like the high scenario at all, and there was no benefits with regards to higher nutrient concentrations. And we also found this when we went and looked at another algae called Laurentia, okay? except for in this case, the high nutrient response was much more marked. Okay? So counter to what some people have tried to suggest is the algae don't like the future any more than um, the coral uh, and the, thi the things that seem to be liking it are um, uh, the bioeroders. Mortality. Okay. Laurentia, Dora didn't particularly like working. She said, oh, it's horrible. It's pretty hard to handle. It dies very easily. And it was just falling over through all the treatments. But I said, nevertheless, we should still see what the mortality was. And what we saw in the case of Laurentia, there was a very high driver with regards to the high nutrients. So, to just to summarize this aspect uh, of the experiment, it's really early days yet. We've only just started putting organisms into um, the system. We've only measured a few seasons. We haven't gone through all the four seasons that we really want to look at to get a collective answer to what's going to happen annually. But the data that we've collected to date doesn't really suggest a rosy future for at least our carbonate balance based on the organisms we've looked at. High coral mortality is not a good thing. Okay? Presume perhaps um, we've only just started to look at algae. We've only looked at a very small subset. We suspect that some algae, and we've got hints that some cyanobacteria really like our future. Okay, and perhaps other algae will too. But at the moment, we shouldn't think that this is a win either because we need to remember that this is the base of the food chain for a lot of herb herbivores on the reef. Uh -huh. So what about the mesocosm experiment? Okay, some people say the part, some of the parts doesn't make the whole. So the mesocosm experiment is meant to sort of address that, to look at the holistic interactions. Okay. So we have 12 large tubs, okay, basically four, um, uh, actually it's three per treatment. Uh, the tubs are es established as mini reefs, okay. Basically we started to put them together about April. Okay. And we brought up the sediments, all the corals from Harry's Bommy. We shook out the infauna from all the corals we brought up. We divvied it up amongst all the different tanks. We started to put various invertebrates in it and over time we've built them up um, so that they look pretty much like each other. Then in about early September we started to gradually increase them so we're taking three months now to bring these uh, mini reefs up to their treatments and the plan is basically just to keep running it 
until we feel like pulling it apart, it gets so smelly that nobody likes it on the deck any longer, and establish who the winners and the losers are in this system. In the meantime, we're going to have a collection of photographic data to show what happens and how these tubs change. This is a photograph taken uh, sort of two months into the establishment phase of these tanks. Okay. Um, this is another one. We've incorporated these things called wave makers in. Um, they pulse water and they change the flow rates and they give uh, the direction and uh, uh, amplitude of the flow so we can get some mirrored effects in it. And what we've done is we can isolate each of those little mesocosms by putting a lid in on it, seal it off, and we can measure holistic calcication effects on those mini communities through time. So this is the data. Nothing's been put in any treatment. This is just the base one data taken in September, and we can look at calcification happening in the middle of the day and basically no calcification happening at the other times. And we can get a collective 24-hour response, and we do the same likewise for photosynthesis. So what we will be doing through the experiment is just following how our different treatments respond with regards to these data points. So together with the photographs that we hope to accumulate, Okay. The reefs themselves, we haven't overcrowded them because we want to give room for growth if growth is going to occur. Um, um, we just really want to know whether they will start to look like the types of reefs Ove has predicted in his 2007 paper or maybe even something uh, perhaps a little bit more scary even than that. Okay where you just have sediments and not much else. Well, apart from the fish, of course. Thank you.